Hello, everyone. I'm here today to talk about spatiotemporal blue noise masks. This is a paper created by myself, Alan Wolf, and also with uh, Nathan Morkel, Thomas Akinin Muller, and Ravi Ramamurthy. So before we get started, I wanted to clarify blue noise samples versus blue noise masks. Blue noise samples are sample points in a domain that you can use for uh, numerical integration, as you can see on the left. And blue noise masks, which are on the right, uh, come from ordered dithering. And where they're used in rendering is mostly in uh, getting per pixel random numbers for stochastic algorithms such that the resulting error is uh, blue noise distributed. Um, both of the, these types of blue noise, uh, they have attenuated low frequencies and randomized high frequencies. Um, that makes them well suited for uh, Gaussian blurring because as you can see by the Gaussian kernel DFT on the right, uh, there's not a, a lot of overlap between um, the Gaussian kernel and uh, the DFT of the blue noise. So this way, when you, when you low-pass filter uh, the blue noise or renderings using the blue noise, um, the high-frequency randomization uh, can go away uh, from the noise and leave more of the, the low frequency of the, of the actual rendered image intact. We'll see that in a minute. And so with that explained, um, this paper is about blue noise masks. So in real-time rendering, we're always wanting to do more with less. And so some great examples of that uh, from, from modern times is on the left, we have RTX GI. And what that is, is if you squint, it's a global illumination from a traditional probe-based GI system, but using ray tracing to update those probes to um, have uh, runtime dynamic GI. Um, and then on the right, we have uh, direct illumination with RTX DI. And this solves the many lights problem uh, by making each pixel kind of learn where to shoot rays for the best results. And it does this by sharing information between pixels over space and also over time. So even though both of these use um, the newfangled uh, ray tracing APIs, which require uh, the new ray tracing hardware in GPUs, um, they use them efficiently to be able to um, do more with less, you know, so using GI probes uh, in a dy dynamic way, or being able to get better lighting with with fewer uh, rays shot out or fewer samples of lights. Um, and so, in that vein, another way to do more with less uh, is basically just stochastic algorithms in general, uh, because they allow tuning for quality versus speed. So on the left, we have one sample per pixel of this ray traced AO, and it's just ugly, but um, it's the fastest. And as you move to the right, um, you can take more samples and spend more, more computation time on your render and get a better result. And so uh, it's very nice uh, in, in real-time rendering when you have a lot of effects that you're trying to get all within budget to be able to tune quality versus speed on such a nice sliding scale. However, uh, at the lower sample counts, it leaves noise behind. Um, but not all noise is created equal. And so like, for instance, um, in the Blue Noise Dithered Sampling paper by George F. and Fajardo, they show us how um, anti-correlated blue noise just gives them a much better result than independent white noise, even though that it has the same error level. And the reason for this is that essentially, uh, white noise uh, tends to clump and leave holes within um, the domain that they're, they're sampling or within the, 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 uh, the values that they represent, where blue noise is more evenly distributed. Um, and so this means that uh, white noise is, is, is very clumpy, where blue noise is very smooth and uh, will give you uh, a better average over smaller numbers of pixels. Uh, when comparing it to the actual average of the ground truth for the same area of pixels. In white noise, that's only true at the limit, so for large numbers of pixels. And like I was saying before, uh, blue noise is much better for filtering under, under a Gaussian filter or other low-pass filtering. So here what we did was we took a full-color image, um, dithered it using white noise on the left, blue noise on the right. Then we quantized it to one bit per color channel, so three-bit color total, and then we Gaussian blurred it, and here are the results. Um, so on the left, you can see where white noise has both high and low frequencies randomized, 
the 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 low frequency randomization survived the low pass filter. And that's why there's blobby noise. Where on the right, uh, since blue noise is only high frequency noise, um, none of the noise survived the the low pass filter, and we have a a much more noise free looking image. Although of course um, the high frequencies of the image uh, are affected by the the high, the high pass filter as well. Um, so that's all good for for single frames, but real-time rendering is animated. And furthermore, it's it's now commonly amortized over time with things like temporal anti-aliasing. And so um, we really need to think about the temporal axis as well as the spatial. And so uh, along that vein, uh, here's the first peek at our spatio-temporal blue noise, where the column on the left is our, our noise. It shows the mask and the DFT over X and Y, as well as X and Z. And so as you can see, over the XY plane, um, we have you know, 2D blue noise, uh, high quality, it's good stuff. And then also uh, the XZ projection uh, shows us that uh, the Z axis is 1D blue noise. Um, and so what that means is that each frame renders 2D blue noise, which is nice for perception and Gaussian filtering and all that. Um, however, each pixel, uh, individually over the z-axis is also blue noise, and that's better for convergence, which I'll show in a minute. Only our noise has both of those properties. Um, a common way to animate blue noise before spatiotemporal blue noise has been around has been to use a flipbook of independent 2D blue noise textures, which we can see in the second column. Uh, it's good over space, but over time it's just white noise. 3D blue noise is good as neither, uh, neither over space nor over time. Um, and then uh, the last two columns are low discrepancy sequences um, that are, are mixed with blue noise. Uh, and you can see more about that in the paper, but essentially what happens is um, they're better convergence over time, but they, they damage the blue noise over space. <clears throat> so let's talk about how we make our, our spatial temporal blue noise. We have two algorithms, one for making scalar valued blue noise. Um, it's, it's a little bit higher quality and it's faster. And then we have a vector noise algorithm, uh, which I'll show next, that runs slower and is a little bit lower quality. So uh, for making scalar noise, we use, uh, we're based on the void and cluster algorithm. And um, the simplified version of this is that you start with a zero energy field and you place a point at the lowest energy and you update the energy field using the energy function. Um, you repeat that second step until all the points are filled in. Uh, the order that the points have been added determines their pixel value. And so for instance, um, if you had a thousand pixels in your image and you were saving an eight bit texture, you would have to remap those uh, zero to 999 to be zero to 255 and then save out your texture. And so our contribution here is that we modified the energy function for the voiding cluster algorithm. Uh, we run it, oops, pardon me. We run it in three dimensions uh, and we use this energy function where Pixels only have energy between them, between each other, if they are from the same xy plane, or if they they have the same xy value, and um, they're just different in the z-axis. And so what this does is makes spatial blue noise, uh, where every pixel is also blue over the z-axis. And so for vector blue noise, we base our work on uh, the blue noise tethered sampling paper by George Ivan Fajardo. And what we do, and this is simulated annealing. So what we do is we initialize the texture to uniform white noise vectors, and then we pick two pixels at random and swap them if doing so improves the overall energy of the texture. And we repeat that until either the energy is low enough or we've reached a, a maximum swap count. And once again, we modified the energy function uh, so that pixels uh, only have energy towards each other if they are from the same x, y plane or if they have the same x, y value, but um, they're at different points on the z axis or on the time axis. And um, an interesting observation we found while doing this work was that you don't actually have to use uniform noise uh, when, when initializing the texture in step one, but you can uh, you know, do, do other uh, distributions and end up with important sampled spatiotemporal blue noise masks. And we'll show more about that in a little bit. So looking at fun function convergence, 
Um, our spatiotemporal blue noises in red. And these are just some simple functions that we're converging or integrating. Um, and so the important things are that our noise is in red, white noise is in blue, which you can see does much worse, worse than our noise consistently for the other noises. And um, purple and teal are the low discrepancy based noises. And so purple and teal uh, often can do better than us in convergence, but they're more temporally erratic. And um, as we saw before, uh, they're lower, lower quality spatially. Um, and so we feel like the, the, the right trade-off is at the lowest of sample counts. You want the best spatial quality you can have. And then on top of that, any better convergence than white noise you can get. And so that, that these graphs are showing that from the convergence point of view. So some rendered results um, in the lower right. This is just the dithering example that we saw before uh, when we Gaussian blurred this picture, but this is without the, the Gaussian blurring. Um, you can see in the lower right, our noise looks the best. Uh, it, our noise is in a blue noise error pattern, but it also is the lowest magnitude. Um, here we use different types of noise and stochastic convolution. And here what we're doing is we're simulating bokeh by doing a convolution of the image against uh, a heart-shaped kernel for uh, like a heart-shaped aperture for a camera lens. Uh, but we're only doing one sample per pixel of, of that convolution kernel. And so we're using different types of noise to select which, which sample to take within that kernel. And you can see once again um, that our noise in the lower right uh, is the best both in the lowest error magnitude and also that the error remains is, is in a, a blue noise distribution. So it's perceptually better. Um, and then lastly, here we have uh, ray traced ambient occlusion. And this one is actually under TAA, where the others were under exponential moving average, which is TAA without uh, temporal reprojection or, or color history clamping. And so once again, you can see that, that our noise um, is the best. We have a, the clearest image, um, lowest error magnitude, and the error we do have is, is uh, blue noise distributed. Um, we've, we feel like uh, our noise is, is pretty well suited for a lot of different tasks. And uh, since blue noise gives you a, a per pixel random number. Um, and so one of these tasks that we've found beyond our work uh, that it's useful in is in some, some really nice results from Heights and Belcourt, where they uh, move pixel seeds around every frame to make a render that, that is a, a blue noise distrib distributed error render. Um, so their usage case was only for uh, spatial filtering um, so they'd render a frame, spatially filter it, and then move on. So it wasn't temporally accumulated. But we found that um, in their algorithm, instead of targeting 2D blue noise uh, textures, that if they target uh, spatiotemporal blue noise textures, is that you can actually get uh, better convergence temporally, as, as these images show. So um, the other shoe dropping with spatiotemporal blue noise a bit is that there is a problem with moving pixels. And the reason for this is that every pixel at a specific point on the screen in XY um, is on a specific uh, sequence over time, like a sampling sequence that has good convergence. If that pixel moves, that means that it's using a different sampling sequence. And if it's moving every frame, what it amounts to is that that, that pixel ends up being um, white noise over time. And when that happens, our noise decays just to 2D blue noise. It does no worse, um, as you can see in these graphs. So on the left, we have um, a still rendering where our noise, spatial temporal blue noise is in orange and regular 2D blue noise is in green. You can see we do better. And then on the right where we have uh, a moving scene, um, our spatial temporal blue noise in orange matches uh, the 2D blue noise in green. Um, <clears throat> so this is really only for one sample per pixel, though. If you take two, three, or four samples per pixel, um, you're still getting the benefits of better convergence. And um, any point in time that anything is still, um, you're going to get some better convergence, which will be carried along by a temporal reprojection as once it starts moving again. So some other results. Um, like I said, that in the simulated annealing algorithm, um, you, you don't need to use uniform vectors. Uh, 
uh, uniform random white noise. So here's some um, spatial temporal blue noise of different size vectors, some uh, normalized, some not. And then the last two columns show some important sampled vectors. Uh, the, the second to the right is a cosine weighted hemisphere. And then the, the rightmost one is a, a spatiotemporal blue noise mask that was optimized towards uh, an HDR skybox. And in both these cases, obviously, when you use them, you need uh, the PDF to be able to uh, integrate correctly. And we found that you can um, get it pretty easily. So in the cosine weighted hemisphere case, you can just do a dot product to get your PDF. And in the, the, the Skybox HDR case, uh, you need to read that texture to get the brightness to apply for lighting anyways. And so you can actually use the brightness to calculate the PDF as well. So some other results, uh, we found that these algorithms generalize to higher dimensions. So here's some 4D blue noise, where on the top, um, XY is 2D blue noise and ZW is 2D blue noise. And on the bottom, XY is 2D blue noise, but then the Z axis is 1D blue noise and the W axis is 1D blue noise. Um, another interesting result we found is that uh, with void and cluster blue noise masks, you can threshold them, uh, the masks, to get pixels that remain, um, that are in the density that you desired from the, the threshold, but also that they are, are blue noise distributed. And so uh, our spatiotemporal blue noise masks made with the void and cluster algorithm also have that property. And this helps in um, things like adaptive sampling, which you can see on the bottom. We have an importance map, and then we sampled it for five frames using different types of noise. Uh, and spatiotemporal blue noise ends up sampling the most unique pixels over the same interval of time, uh, while also leaving um, the error uh, distributed as blue noise, so it's better perceptually. So in summary, spatiotemporal blue noise is a drop-in replacement for traditional blue noise masks. Um, if you are using independent blue noise masks as a flipbook, you just use our masks as a flipbook instead. Um, it won't ever do any worse, and it can in fact do quite a bit better. Um, Spatiotemporal blue noise is blue noise, which has been optimized to be better than white noise for convergence temporally. It can be either scalar valued or vector valued, and it can be uh, uniform or important sampled. Um, as far as future work goes, uh, it would be interesting to try to optimize this for other filters because it's uh, the, the blue noise is, set, is essentially optimized for a Gaussian low pass filter spatially. So, you know, what, what if we optimize this for a box blur? What would that look like? Um, also optimizing these, these uh, pre-calculated sampling textures for different rendering techniques and even different content. Um, it would also be interesting to try to optimize them temporally to target TAA better or EMA better for other temporal filtering techniques. Um, and also, uh, I think it's important to try to address the, the convergence of moving pixels. And one idea we have for that is if multiple pixels are moving in the same direction because they're like on the surface of an object, maybe we can uh, make them migrate their, their sampling sequences altogether so that they can keep the, the better convergence temporally while still having the, the same noise uh, spatially. And so that's it. Thank you very much.